Hi, welcome to the Event Professionals Network podcast. This is episode three, where I share and present about how to run a virtual event. First off, thanks so much to the Metadata team and their events community demand for inviting me to speak. And now let's dive in and enjoy this one hour presentation on how to run virtual events. I think we're ready to go, Lisa. I'll pass on over to you. All right. So thank you so much for the kind intro. I appreciate it. Um, thanks to everyone who is joining. Please let me know where you're joining from in the chat. I'd love to hear from you. And if you are watching post this session, thanks for tuning in. I hope you walk away with a ton of new insights and take to your team and to your next event. Um, if there's something after this presentation that you still have questions about, I will put my contact information or ways for you to reach me at the very end. So feel free to reach out anytime. If you know me, you know that um, I'm ha happy to help anyone in the industry. So, all right, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, I'm estimating that this presentation is going to be about 50 minutes, so about 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, Katie, if you wouldn't mind monitoring the Q&A and kind of jotting down questions, that would be great. I'll also be doing a lot of interaction in the chat and in other locations. So I'm really hoping that you guys interact along the way, um, because that will make for a more engaging and fun presentation. All right, so we are going to go over virtual events. At first, I thought, well, let's go ahead and talk about the top three takeaways. But then I was like, you know what? <laughs> There's a lot more that has to do with just top three takeaways. Virtual events are very complex. And so is event marketing and event planning in general. So let's go ahead and dive in. All right. So today you're going to learn and walk away with building new connections, hopefully within this community and additional communities that I'll share in a bit best practices for planning virtual events and just working with teams and planning events in general, and new tools and ideas that you can incorporate right away into your next virtual event. And then, of course, once your virtual event is over, what do you do next? So let's go ahead and dive in. Um, here, these images represent what a virtual event for me typically looks like, um, some adventure, some fun, some entertainment, and of course, um, I know a lot of you are working from home, so furry friends and coworkers within um, in your home uh, are also uh, fun to give you your daily support. I could go through and tell you about my whole story from doing events from 23 years. I do have lots of stories, and I'm actually writing a book about some of the crazy stories here pretty soon. But instead, I'm going to share my superpowers um, because I think if you're in this industry, You've almost been through it all. Um, if you're just starting out, um, welcome to the industry. It's super fun. Uh, but in a minute, you're going to type in yours. So if you have a piece of paper, jot down some things that you think are superpowers so that people within this room can say, ah, okay, I know Katie's really good at this or Megan's really good at this. Um, I have done events for quite a few years, um, traveling the world. And then since the pandemic start, started, I've been doing virtual events nonstop. Pre-pandemic, I did a lot of live streaming, which is very similar to virtual events. That's why virtual events wasn't quite so scary when it started for me personally. Um, I love to learn. So I'm always listening to an audiobook, a podcast. I'm very inquisitive. I wake up with a half glass full. I love uh, building friendships in the industry. I spend a lot of time on it every single day, just helping people out. Um, and at AWS reInvent, a gentleman said, well, what do you get out of doing all this? <laughs> I was like, well, if you know me, you know that I'm not coming to get something out of it. I really just genuinely um, love to help people. My mom was a school teacher and my dad is an entrepreneur and I am a healthy combination of both of those things. And then last but not least, I love to problem solve. So um, in virtual events, that's super important because Unlike in-person events, you can see people right there. You can problem solve, you know, together in a team virtual events. You're really kind of most of the time sitting at home with your production team all over the world. So problem solving is um, one of my favorite things. And then 
I also wanted to talk about sort of the legacy that I want to leave. If you're in events, um, probably this is more of a hobby to you. So if I got hit by a bus or I like to also say if I got hit by a lottery ticket in the industry my and just in my life, my most important things that I want to accomplish if I get hit by a lottery ticket is building trust, helping others, and making sure my family is all always a priority. And because you are an event marketing and event manager, you are part of our collective family. So if, like I said, there's something at the end of this that you have questions about or just events in general, feel free to reach out anytime. I genuinely mean that. All right, so let's learn about you. What are your superpowers? This is gonna be our first interactive. Um, you can go to pollev.com backslash Lisa Gregory 725, or you can text Lisa Gregory 725 to 22333. And in just a minute, hopefully you guys will be putting some superpowers in here and I can um, show the screen once some superpowers have been added. Um, Katie, if you wouldn't mind putting that in the chat so people can just copy and paste it. As you go in there, it'll only work if you put your superpowers in and let me make sure if it's working. Yep, okay, it should be working. So click away and add your stuff in there. And then um, we're also gonna try Zoom polls to just show some interactive fun stuff um, of how Zoom can work. So have you always known that you want to plan events for your career? Um, I know I have, my grandmother showed me planning events my whole life, same with my mother. So I did grow up knowing I wanted to do events um, right away. So we have the poll is now launched. So you can go ahead and start replying in the poll, another fun way to interact in a virtual event. So please, please, please um, interact. That would be great. And then I'll share the results here in just a minute. Or Katie, you can jump on and share the results. And then finally, let's learn about you via Zoom chat. Again, another way to interact with your audience. Which industry verticals do you work in? So what's representing? I know I work in tech, healthcare, et cetera. So it's just kind of fun to see which verticals everybody's working in. And Katie, if you want to um, come on and mention the poll results, that would be great. Absolutely. So have you always known you want to plan events for your career? A large majority of y'all did not think that this was going to be your career path. This is super interesting because it's such a niche industry and, and a niche plan. So um, yeah, about 75% of y'all. That's crazy. I had no yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah, we just kind of fall. A lot of people just kind of fall into it. So I fell into it in uh, in college. So I'd be curious if in the chat, you wouldn't put like how you fell into it if you didn't plan on this like when was it was it in college was it after college it's kind of or maybe you didn't go to college you you know just started doing it and loved it right right out of high school or whatever um all right so that's kind of some fun ways for us to get to know each other now let's have a bit of story time um storytelling in virtual events is very important so that's why I'm adding this interaction I think a lot of the times to have a good virtual event we have to coach our presenters on how to do that. So that's why I am starting with these interactions and the story time. All right. So actually, I'm going to make sure I'm sharing my audio here. Um, there we go. And I'm going to go ahead and go to my next slide. All right. So it sounds like the audio is kind of low, but that's OK. So once upon a time in March 2020, um, I had I was forecasted to have the best year ever, 29 events all over the world. And then all of a sudden, when COVID hit, boom, I went down to six events. A few days later, boom, I went down to four events. We all, as a collective community, had to pivot very, very quickly. Thus, the idea. Virtual events. Now, what do we do next? What are virtual events? What does that even mean? How do we get to our audience? So somebody came up with this great idea and I I listen to podcasts like I was saying all the time and someone was saying virtual events have been around forever. That's true. Virtual events have been around since video and Zoom and all that started webinars and stuff like that. But virtual events as we know it 
significantly changed in March 2020. And I have been on that ride significantly since then because I'm a small business owner. So I didn't have the opportunity to kind of sit back, relax, and wait for me to sort of research or wait for my boss to kind of tell me, oh, we might do this, we might not. I had to jump in right away. So that's part of the reason why, um, you know, we've planned actually 22 virtual events alone this year. We had two virtual events this week alone. So how do you even decide you're going virtual? Um, now it's not as much of a necessity as it was. So some people are going back in person, some people are doing virtual, and some people are doing hybrid. How do you even decide? And I think this is where one of you know, an executive comes in and just says, we need to do this thing. And a lot of event planners are like, okay, well, let's execute. My call to action for you guys is to pause and say, okay, we have this great idea. That's wonderful. Now let's go into KPI planning. Now in the chat, if you have heard of KPI planning, um, if you wouldn't mind just saying, yes, I know what KPI planning is. And if you don't, that's totally fine. But KPI stands for Key Performance Indicators. And hopefully your company, like globally, has KPIs for every single department to be heading towards. Essentially, KPI is a fancy way of saying goals, just common goals that everybody is racing to. I find a lot of the times with just events in general, the goals are very fuzzy. <laughs> it's usually just this idea. And then the goals come later when someone says, okay, what's the ROI? So let's pause and do the KPI planning and team alignment first before we decide what we wanna do. So here's some example discussion um, categories um, for you guys to kind of go through with your team. And I actually put this in a spreadsheet. So I start a spreadsheet with the team and we discuss the audience. Is it for customers, prospects, or like in this case, it's for a community? How are we gonna engage people? So is it gonna be, does it make sense to be in person? Or is our audience, you know, globally all over the world in London, in New York, in San Francisco? Is it gonna be just virtual because we're trying to go green? We're being fiscally responsible or um, our audience doesn't have budget to come in? Or are we doing hybrid? Doing hybrid is great. However, you have to be careful on the planning side to make sure that you're understanding how much work that actually is to execute. Um, I'd also be curious in the chat of how many people have, um... <laughs> Aaron Wood, you're funny. Yes, you are dating Lisa. Um, <laughs> that's my boyfriend. Um, so a lot of people with hybrid events don't realize that it's actually double the work. So if you have an internal events team, you're used to doing a user conference, and now you're doing virtual, um, you want to be sure that you understand the implications on not just you, but your team. Um, pipeline, if it's going to be, you know, new, expanded, community or versus a community event. Um, a big one for virtual events and any event is registration. How are you going to hit your registration goals? What's realistic for the marketplace at this time? Is your company lots of buzz? Are you releasing a new product? Or um, is it just you're holding your annual user conference and you might anticipate a 10 to 15 or 20 percent uh, attendance drop off or in person, but virtual could be up to 50 percent. Um, it just kind of depends. So it's good. Again, getting your team aligned on what those expectations are. And this community can help. So a lot of these folks in the demand community and another community that I run um, have been doing virtual events. So ask for those stats so that your team isn't putting a finger in the wind and kind of guessing. On the content side, for virtual events, and we see this all the time with our clients, they say, okay, we're going to try to go get all these sessions. What sessions? Are they going to be keynotes? Are they going to be 30-minute um, sessions, lightning talk sessions? What kind of sessions are going to resonate and meet those strategic goals for your team? And if you don't know that going into your virtual event, you're going to have issues. And I'll tell you why in just a little bit. 
Are you going to have sponsors? Does it make sense? A lot of people think sponsorships and virtual events are no good. However, that's not true. It just has to be proper alignment and expectations for what the sponsor is getting and what your team is getting. Also on the revenue side, um, virtual events are not always less expensive. Now they are in a lot of ways compared to in-person because you don't have to pay for the food and beverage. You might not have to fly your team in. However, virtual events aren't necessarily leaps and bounds um, less expensive. It depends on what platform you're using. It depends on how much you want to entertain your audience. And again, what your goals are. Um, I always say that the KPI planning helps you create a recipe for success. Um, there could be, for example, when you're cooking in your kitchen, you might have this wonderful cookie recipe, but if you added a little bit of cinnamon and a little bit of extra sugar, it just blows somebody else's mind. It's not just a plain cookie. So that recipe is really important to start before you do anything. How are you going to entertain people? How are you going to do networking? How are you going to run your marketing campaigns and your sales enablement? Again, all of that with your KPIs. And the way that I do it is I just build a spreadsheet. I put all the categories that I want to talk to, my manager, my team, anyone that's on the team should attend this call. It's typically one hour. However, some people spend lots of time on it, which I absolutely love. Um, and sometimes it can be up to three hours and sometimes it can be more. And don't be surprised if you have lots of homework afterwards. All right, so as you can tell, <laughs> KPIs are very important. Okay, so you've done your KPIs. You have determined and your team is alignment, including your leadership team, that virtual is the way to go. So let's go. Now it's time for your KPI planning follow-up. Determine who you need to have meetings with and ensure that those top key stakeholders are bought in. Then after you figure out all that, everyone kind of has their plan and knows what's going on, figure out what your reporting cadence is, whether it's like maybe it's a monthly reporting cadence at the beginning. And then as you get closer, it increases to keep in contact with your team. Because if your team isn't bought in into this virtual process or any event, but especially virtual, then you're going to start losing them. And that's when events go off the rail. Another way to prevent your events from going off the rail or just really to ensure success is to create a racy. And if you've never created a racy before, uh, Miss Katie is going to put a link in the chat here with where you can learn more about what a racy is. But pro tip, you want to make sure that there's one person assigned whenever possible, not always possible, to a specific thing. So you have responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. I could spend literally a whole 30 minutes or an hour talking about the benefits of a RACI, um, but that's not what this is, um, this webinar is about. So I'm gonna keep going. All right, so your KPIs are done. You've got your RACI, you've started doing your research and doing your meetings. Now it's, um, time to do your work back planning. How do you typically build your to-do list? Any to-do list. I know when I'm going to the grocery store, I build my to-do list from top to bottom. I have a new challenge for you. And it kind of surprises me when a lot of people don't do this. And you can use this in any campaign planning period. And actually, I use it in what I call life planning. I build my plan horizontally first by month. So as you can see, I have an example at the top here. It says February, March, April, May, June, July, August. So say your planning cycle starts in February and it ends in August. I build my spreadsheet um, left to right. So if you were to envision your spreadsheet and you might as well just create a Google spreadsheet right now, that way you can draft it out. But you would say, you know, column, you know, a would be January, February, March, April, et cetera. And then you build all of the things that need to get done in that month so you can understand the dependencies going down the line. For example, you're working cross-functionally across many, many different teams or with subcontractors. So it's important for you to know that the design team has another major project right in July 
right before your event. So they aren't going to be as available as they might normally be. So you might have to get your deadlines done earlier. You also will find out things like video editing needs to be done a lot sooner. And if you're planning an event during the summer season, people are going to be going on vacation. Same with the um, December and you know the other holidays. So you build all of that in. You're not just thinking about your event. You're thinking about every single cross-functional campaign that's happening within your company, how to integrate within those campaigns. And then what you're also thinking about, which is near and dear to my heart, because in this industry, it's really easy to do burnout, is people and life. You have to build the people and the life in. And when I mean people and life, I mean vacation, people not hitting deadlines, making sure that you have time for um, QA in everything that you do. So this planning timeline this way will give you a little bit more visibility. Then as you have that general high level milestone, you don't have to put every detail in there um, horizontally. Then you go in and you take that information and you build it vertically and then you categorize it. So with those categories here, a few in mind, but I love to color code if anyone's been in any of my spreadsheets, um, makes me feel motivated to go in when everything looks harmonious, but you add your categories and then you build away. All right. So now you have your goals, you have your general plan. Now you're in your research phase. You're trying to decide which platform to go through, which speakers are going to um, going through, you've got your feedback from all those meetings that you've done and you're starting to research all of the things. You're drafting out your budget because your manager might have thought, oh, virtual events are free. They're, you know, just, just use Zoom. However, through your KPI planning, what you've realized is that with an enterprise audience, you can't use Zoom. It doesn't have the functionality that you need. So you need to buy a platform. Those platforms could be $25,000 to $150,000. And then you have to kind of go back to your manager and say, okay, let's realign on those KPIs and the budget. That's when all of this magic starts to happen. Also with your platform and production, before you do any platform research, I highly recommend you determine what types of sessions are you, you're going to flow through your platform or even through Zoom. Questions to ask yourself. Are you pre-recording? Are you going live or are you doing both? Will your MC be live or are they pre-recording and a video editor is weaving everything together? How are you doing entertainment? Think through all the things early because as you go get that bid, which I highly recommend again, creating a spreadsheet with a checklist of all the things that you need, reporting, um, budget, you know, how you're working all of your records, you're going to need to ask those questions. Your platform decision is one of the most important decisions that you will make with the virtual event. So, and I have some that I'm going to mention that I absolutely love. And then on the speaker side, be sure you draft your plan. I can't tell you the amount of customers that just say, okay, we're going to start asking all of our, you know, top customers to come and speak. And I'm like, well, how long is your agenda? Is it two days, one track? Is it one day for five hours? Or is it four tracks over three weeks? Virtual events in that KPI planning will help you determine that. Then you can go to the people reaching out and say, that's not a good idea. Don't go broadly ask all these customers to talk because we actually only have five talk slots. That's right, only five. Or Yes, we need to fill 60 slots. We need to open up a CFP and there needs to be a whole strategy around it. Um, those conversations happen at this point. And then um, keep in mind, every single tiny little thing that you add creates management and production time. So a lot of times executives don't have visibility into that. They just think, oh, well, it's fine. We'll just add five more sessions. Well, your team might not have the bandwidth for that five more sessions, and actually it might not even tie to your KPIs. So maybe those five sessions turn into a post-show webinar 
or maybe you don't do them at all, at all. Those conversations are okay to have. And I highly encourage you to have them because not only does it include management time and production, but it also takes your marketing team away from other projects and initiatives that is also a goal for your um, leadership team. And it typically also costs you money. So as you're growing in your profession, um, keeping those things in mind will, will help you be a thought leader with your manager and your team, and then also help you be a better event planner. One thing I think a lot of people sort of forget in virtual events is entertainment and networking. So don't skip that. I think sometimes people are really focused on that content part. And actually, Metadata does an amazing job of this if you've ever attended one of their events. Just splicing and dicing cool things in, like that little girl at the beginning doing the disco dancing or a little bit of music when Katie came on. So those things are equally important. So let's share our favorites. And I'm going to share mine in just a little bit. Um, if you wouldn't mind putting in the chat what your favorite tools are, and I'm going to actually share, or Katie's going to share a form. Yep, there we go. Thank you, Katie. If you wouldn't mind filling out the form, and the reason why we're doing this form um, is because then you can help other people, and we're going to share those results in the demand community with everyone. That way, if there's a favorites that's not on there of ours, we can share that with the community. So thank you, Katie. Um, and then I have a few favorites um, that Katie's going to put in there. Cameo, Blueboard, and Get Mebo are some of the more unique offerings that I've put in there um, or used. But of course, there's millions of platforms. How do you even decide which platform do you go with? And then the presentation formats, again, you need to figure that part out. What are your favorites? I personally love lightning talks. I think in a virtual world, people like short content or very engaging content. So like I'm keeping you guys busy <laughs> with these goals and ideas. So hopefully it's engaging. And then how are you entertaining people? What are your favorite things to do? I have a gal I use for yoga all the time. I love using Spotify playlists. I think those are really fun. Um, and then I love sending people food in the in the mail. I think it's fun sending those like cocktail kits. Here is a glimpse at my favorites. I'm gonna tell you my top three favorites um, here in just a minute. But every single one of these things does something different. Sessionize is a wonderful um, CFP tool and that's really just ways to collect um, speaker talk titles and descriptions for ideas for your agenda. Zoom, of course, we're using right now. It's fantastic. And they've done some recent updates um, for sharing video and all sorts of fun stuff. So it is a good option for something like this. Um, Google Slides or just the Google Suite in general is a wonderful way to collaborate with your team and external vendors. Blueboard is really fun in appreciation and can be great for sales kickoffs or company kickoffs. One of my favorites is Web Captioner. Um, it's for accessibility for your virtual events and anyone can use it. It's completely free. Um, I use it at a ton of our virtual events. If you're doing social media, by far Sprout Social is my favorite. And if you're looking at my slides now and you're thinking, gosh, how did she get that little video in there? Or how did she design all of this? Well, I use Canva. It's my top, like my very top find through the pandemic. That's my very most fun new technology that I use is Canva. I use it every day. Um, Mentimeter is a whiteboard um, where you can collaborate. Great for a panel conversation. Not great for very, very large teams because it weighs down your um, your internet bandwidth. So keep that in mind, although it is a great tool. Another one that I want to share is Marco Experiences. You can do all sorts of gaming and trivia. You can send kits to people's homes. So if you haven't checked that out on the experiential side, I highly recommend it. Um, I know this is probably Megan's favorite tool as well <laughs> as mine. Um, and lots of our team is Asana, number one project management tool by far, helps keep your team held accountable for all your marketing campaigns and really helps make sure that everybody's on the same page. 
if you're not using the Google Sheets. One that I think a lot of people aren't using is Grammarly. I use it a lot. Um, I, um, I like to keep content succinct, short, and to the point. And so Grammarly, you can take all of your content for all your emails and promotions, put it in Grammarly, and poof, it will recommend different ways to write it where um, you can use different, like some words are overused. Like I say amazing a lot. Um, so it recognizes that I say that. It'll pull it out and recommend something else. I love, love, love doing yoga. I highly recommend if you're doing virtual events to find people that can do all sorts of things. Um, meditation is really fun. And then you can find a cool video on um, YouTube and kind of play some, you know, crashing waves or birds tripping in the Swiss Alps. You can bring this global cool setting in so many different ways virtually. Um, you can do it in person too. That's the best part, I think, about what happened with COVID is it challenged us to learn and experience events and the attendee experience in a whole different way that at least I had never um, been a part of before. So I love that idea of just like thinking outside the box, which is one of the best parts about um, virtual events. And then if you know me, you know, Goldcast is one of my favorite um virtual platforms. I could talk and talk and talk about how wonderful they are. One of their founders is um, just won an award actually today. I can't remember, not like an award, but you know what I mean. It, he got some recognitions on the 30 or under 30 Forbes recognition list. And they're just doing really great things. Um, and they have a great team. Snap Bar, you can actually do a little demo of Snap Bar. Uh, we use them a lot. Um, and if you haven't seen, if you didn't get our playlist in Spotify for this event, um, Katie can put the link in there. You can see one of my um, Snap Bar photos of waffles. My puppy is in there, but I love Snap Bar. And here's some ideas that I use it. If it's a global event, it's nice for people to take photos of their workspace and say, hey, I'm joining from Portland, Oregon, or I'm joining from Israel or London or, you know, wherever. And it kind of brings people into their different workspace. Um, another one that I love to do is just get creative and they can win prizes. So one person turned their camera upside down and did a bunch of cool upside down shots. Some people feature their furry friends, what have you. Um, Postal is another one I like. They actually will send your guests for your event um, like swag kits. So if you have some VIPs or what have you, you want to send them a mug or what have you, they can put all those kits together. By far, my favorite DJ is DJ Graffiti. Um, he just, the I love him because he's a great entertainer, but he gives back to this community in such a meaningful way through music. And if you're lucky, his daughter will come online as well and um, do some grooves and dancing for your team. Um, we do have a few streaming tools that I really love. StreamYard and Restream are two of those. Um, it really helps you up-level your production. You do need some sort of software to bring that into. So you could use Zoom or um, uh, there's another one that I use called Gradual. It's a great community platform. Um, if you haven't yet looked into Cameo, it's a great way to do a fun intro, especially for like company kickoffs. Um, we did one where Montel Jordan opened up an event and talked about how this community had grown and everything was going great with the company. And then he did the, this is how we do it song at the end. And that was funny. Everybody was like, just absolutely loved it. And there's a lot, that's a great way to incorporate celebrities or guest speaker kind of situations into your event in a really affordable way. I already mentioned Spotify, but Spotify on the production side is great because it lets you cross um, fade music and create custom lists. You do have to be careful though, because if you are going to post something on YouTube or something like that, you wanna make sure that um, you don't have rights to all of your music. So either are gonna wanna make sure you have those rights or you use um, royalty-free music. 
Um, Miro is another one that I really love. You can basically do collaboration in a Miro board with everybody and kind of more of a project management where everybody has visibility. I mentioned the cocktail kits that you can send. I got that as a thank you. So at the end of an event, um, one of our clients as an appreciation sent us these cocktail kits. They arrived the day of the last day of the event actually, and we all had cocktails together and celebrated the success of the client. Um, Poll Everywhere was one of those ones that I showed um, kind of somebody interacted in at the beginning, but essentially you can put the link in the chat and then people can create wordles. They can put in there where they're joining in the world and it's a map and it shows little dots of where they're joining. So say you have 10,000 people joining from your event. It's kind of like a heat map. Um, another amazing tool that I love. And of course, YouTube, you have to do something with your content after it's done. Keep it alive for as long as possible. And Mebo is the last one. Mebo is a virtual world. Um, and let's see. Oh, yeah, it's Get Mebo. I think Katie put it in the chat, but definitely open um, the getmebo.com and you can kind of see they put your video head and then you can walk through these virtual worlds, um, which is super fun. All right, so my top three, though, I have to say is number one is Canva. Absolutely love it. If you aren't using it, your company is not using it, highly recommend you get it. Um, I kind of went with the playful and fun, but it equally does the corporate enterprise branding as well. And Goldcast is my favorite virtual tool. And the reason for that is because it you can throw anything at Goldcast and it can take it. Virtual events are a whole new world where sometimes you have only pre-recorded sessions and sometimes it's only live. And sometimes it's a hybrid mishmash of all the things. And you're like, ah, one 30 minute segments pre-record with the host coming in live. Goldcast handles every situation very, very well. So that's why they're my number one pick. And for just fun and getting people to connect, I love Snap Bar. So again, this is Waffles Cutie Pie Chicoletta Gregory. That's my puppy and coworker, best coworker of all time. Um, I get to share this with you in a cool way. Um, and then you can take those photos like I did with a company kickoff and you can put all the faces of your company and then all the furry friends and then you can theme it per day and it just creates this interaction. Now, not everyone will engage and that's okay, but a good 30% will because when you're just like you're in person, you've got your extroverts and your introverts. Just because an extrovert doesn't participate doesn't mean that they don't enjoy the silly components where the other people are joining. And sometimes they do. So it's just kind of fun to weave in a little bit of something for everybody. All right. So we've hopefully had some fun learning about some cool tools. Now we're going to talk about campaigning or campaign planning and enablement. Um, without this, uh, your marketing campaigns and your events, it's hard to get some success. So it helps to build your plan again horizontally. Think about what needs to happen in each month and don't just think about what you're doing with your event, but again, integrate with all the campaigns and the life of your team. Um, and then you want to have different target audiences. Now, the number one thing in campaign planning that we see clients miss, anyone know? Let's see if anyone can guess. I'll give you a hint. It's on this slide. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> if anyone's going to chime in, but the number one thing that people forget in campaign planning is internal communication and enabling that internal team. Now they might activate their sales team, I would hope, but the whole company is really throwing this event or could potentially be helping to promote this event. So just empowering your sales team, I feel like is not good enough. You need to be keeping your whole company informed, even if it's just fun things like, hey, save the date for this. Or guess what? We, we have these top customers and they're going to be speaking. We just want to keep you in the loop. And you can do that in all hands, Slack, email, you name it. 
Of course, you want to do whatever your external target is. Make sure that's just kind of your more traditional marketing. And then you have to activate your supporters. So there's a whole nother segment, your speakers, sponsors, partners, community members, anyone who's helping to drive attendance, but in a fun way. So for example, with Katie, I did some fun posts on LinkedIn. That's exactly probably Katie was like, yes, <laughs> good. She's helping drive attendance and awareness. That's exactly what we want. So give them the tools to be able to do that. A social media card is perfect. Um, you can give them example posts that you've already written, help activate this team um, in a fun new way rather than just sending emails and social um, to your regular lists. There's any other campaign ideas or anything like that that you guys do that you found successful, you can feel free to put them in the chat. And then everyone always says, well, gosh, can you draft our campaign cadence and what outline outlets we should be looking at, you know, doing? Yes, we can. <laughs> but the thing is, is every event is different. That's where we get back to that KPI planning. Your goals at the very beginning will help inform what your campaigns should look like. And I wanna challenge you with, just because you've traditionally done something a certain way, doesn't mean it's gonna just be that perfect recipe for every single event. So look back at the campaigns you've done in the past, if you can, and see what your um, unfollow rates were or your engagement and sort of look at that and then reduplicate it. Blogs are a great way to engage people taking content, um, you know, maybe you want to do a, a speaker promo, like Katie and I could have met at the beginning, and I could have done like a mini promo telling, talking with Katie about what I'm going to cover, um, little things like that you can post on social media to help drive that excitement and build that cadence. I would challenge you, though, to make sure that you're not overtaxing your team, because your team isn't just running your event, they're running all of your integrated campaigns. So making sure as much as possible to integrate things within the newsletter you're already sending, um, the slide deck your sales team is already presenting to customers that you're looking to invite. So that's um, will help you spread the love for your event, but not overtax your team. All right, so you've got your campaigns, everything's rolling, registration's coming in, you've got your platform selected, your agenda's done, you've started thinking about your entertainment. Now we're getting to the production part of your virtual event. With run of show creation, which I some of you might not even have created a run of show before, um, this is really a step-by-step plan, minute by minute plan on what you're going to do for your event. And Katie, <laughs> I was probably like, Lisa, what are you doing? I created an actual run of show for this very presentation. And that's how Katie was able to get all of these links and be able to share things with you and help me as the presenter kind of easily funnel through these slides. Now that's exactly what you want to do for your team and your speakers. So you can see for this particular team on the production side, we had uh, just a general production monitor, we had a chat manager, a production manager, and a speaker manager. For your staffing, the only way you're gonna know, need or know what your staffing needs are is to really think through your full run of show. Now for this show that we, we ran two virtual events this week, one was um, a four day event, and we wanted to make sure that first day nothing wrong happened on the production side and everything was super solid. So we chose to have four people on that first day. Once everything went smooth, we reduced it down to three people just to make sure that the client was covered. So um, sometimes people hire externally like a team like ours and sometimes people enable their team to help with the management. Either way works, but regardless, you do need to make sure you're staffing your event rather early to make sure that people are trained. Then you go through and you add the speaker check-in times. We recommend that speakers check in at least 20 minutes prior to their session start time, if not 30 minutes. If you think about someone checking in, say their microphone's not working, their lighting is really bad, maybe they don't know how to share their screen or they're only working off one monitor and they're kind of nervous, um, 
you can't fix too much in 20 minutes. It's kind of like quickly getting them on, but it's a balance because your speakers are likely VIPs and you want to be very mindful of their time. So discussing what that best works and the complication of the virtual tool. Zoom, for example, is super easy to get on. So Katie and I joined like five minutes before we needed to go live because we do this all of the time. Now, if I was working with a client that doesn't do this all the time, doesn't present all the time, they're a little bit more nervous, then I would have them join 30 minutes early. Also with the equipment, um, and I'll go through this in a little bit of checklisting everything to make sure you're good to go. So we create a speaker checklist. Um, I had the link here because it's um, private for the customer, but you would link that in here. And then you go live, have a countdown video, make it kind of fun like we had um, as people join. And then we literally write in all of the scripts. So for Katie, I pre-wrote her script um, and everything to make sure she, she was good to go. And then you just hit repeat for every single session. Um, include that audience engagement as well. I think that's also something that speakers kind of forget is they're presenting and they're not interacting. So um, you'll have to coach them along the way. Okay, so you're ready to go. You're getting ready to plan this thing. How do you make sure to avoid the oh shit moments? Because guess what? <laughs> they're coming. And you can't prevent everything, right? So some stuff's just gonna come, a speaker's gonna come late. They could get COVID at the last minute. Um, their internet might die, say there's a storm or something like that, and they can't get on Wi-Fi. This is a sure way to go through what could happen pre-event, during, and post-event. So make that plan early. And the number one thing is make sure your manager and your teams understand what that plan is. So for example, Say we join and the platform is crashed. It doesn't work. It's just gone. What is your backup plan? You have no platform. Are you going to have Zoom be your backup? Or are you simply going to pre-plan that if the virtual platform doesn't work on the day of, that you're just not hosting the meeting and you'll email everybody and say, we're sorry, the virtual platform had an error we are gonna reschedule for these dates and your speakers are aware of what those rescheduled dates are in advance. Or say you have budget cuts and all of a sudden you don't have a budget for your DJ and for all this stuff. You would know by checking in with your manager that by 30 days out in your budget, you would already have listed when you need to pull out of that contract in order to make those budget cuts or your manager would have already been informed and he comes to you and says, I need these budget cuts. And you can say, totally get it. But now remember when we had that meeting, I informed you that that date was the last day to let go of the DJ. It, we're past that date now. So we're kind of, we can definitely ask where we're kind of, we're kind of a little bit stuck. One thing that's very common for pre-recorded videos is that a lot of people either don't show up to their session record or they send in the video. I highly recommend though, pause. I highly recommend if you're gonna do pre-recorded sessions with your speakers that you hire a team like ours um, to help you with your pre-recorded sessions. Otherwise you never know what you're gonna get. Um, and 99% of the time the record is not of high quality. Okay, so say we have hired a production team and they're doing those records and somebody is in Tel Aviv and they were having a hard time scheduling with them. They're coming in hot and they miss their recorded scheduled time. Having a plan that says to all of your speakers in advance, we're happy to pre-record your sessions up until this date. After this date, please assume that you will now go live. And then they know that they, they have that option to go live if for some reason they don't want to pre-record. So some of those things will really help you. Another one is team turnover. You might have trained somebody to be an MC or a host or a production manager. And then all of a sudden 
there's been layoffs or that person goes and gets hit by a lottery ticket and gets this new job and then you have a hole that you have to fill. Having a plan to understand what that looks like and who's going to be the backfill. Basically, if that stuff happens, you're like, no worries, I have a plan for that. During the event, you are going to experience little things that pop up. One of those things that we've experienced is that platforms have updates. And unfortunately, they can't only wait for me as a client to make an update. You know, we had a platform make an update the day before. They can't just call Lisa and say, Lisa, <laughs> you have a virtual event tomorrow. We're going to wait to do the platform update until the, your event is over just because we love you so much. Nah, they can't do that. They need to hit their launch dates. So making sure you get in early with your team. So like, for example, if your event starts at nine and you're going live at nine, your team should really be in there at 730 to make sure everybody's Wi-Fi is working. The platform hasn't had any changes. Everything looks perfect and you're good to go that day. Even though the day before it might've looked one way, the next day it could look another. That's just the world that we live in. Um, also, there could be a huge political issue or some world thing that's happening, and then it might not even make sense for you to host your event at all, right? It might be insensitive, or it might just not flow with your community. So having that plan of like, okay, if we did need to reschedule, when would that reschedule date be? And post the event, what happens if the platform doesn't record your sessions? Do you have a plan for that? Like, are you going to ask all of your speakers to re-record their sessions? Or maybe just somebody's microphone was really bad and you need to let speakers know in advance that, hey, if your session some for some reason is poor quality, there is a chance that we might need you to reshoot. What happens if the data you get from the platform or the data that you were hoping to get or that your leadership wanted isn't of the quality that you were hoping for. So you couldn't score your ROI for your event the way that you wanted to. I've got an amazing tip for this because guess what? It has happened to me. When you're doing your production for your virtual event, on the left side of every single session, add a section where you can write in how many people attended that session at that time. Because really, if you're doing a run of show and you're running that production, you're checking your production sheet anyways and checking them in. The same time you check them in, all you have to do is glance and say, okay, we've got 200 people on right now. I'm just going to jot that in. It does two things. It safeguards you at the end to get the reporting that you need. And then it also helps keep your team informed by the minute on how many people are in that platform. I also recommend that you are communicating with your team in a specific area and you could go back and look at your chats. Slack is a wonderful way to do that. You can do like time check X amount of people or hey, as your speaker's coming in, hey, speaker has arrived, we're good to go. Or speaker hasn't arrived, we're in the red. Who has their cell phone number and make sure that you contact them. So your risk management plan is the number one thing that I hope you walk away with to take and make sure that you can avoid those oh shit moments. And you know what? If there is one, it's okay because you already have a plan for it. And how do I make sure <laughs> that we know what to do and all that stuff? Well, as you can imagine, in the events world, we are quite type A. So we have production checklists for almost everything. We have a checklist for a checklist. Production has a checklist. I have a checklist for me when I come in for production. Did I, you know, in the morning I've got, and I'll show you in just a minute, kind of my setup, but I've got all my setup. I literally have a checklist for my production checklist. Same for staffing. When they come in in the morning, what do they need to do? What do they need to wear? All that stuff. Speakers is the absolute number one checklist that you need to provide. Little things like making sure they understand that they need to use a virtual background or eek, even worse, the platform doesn't have virtual background capabilities. And all of a sudden your speaker's coming in and their office is just a complete mess 
and they don't have a virtual background. And that's their first interaction with you is scrambling, trying to clean up all the laundry <laughs> that's in the back. Um, and then making sure that if it's a platform that requires that they use the latest version of Google Chrome or that they have their VPN off even to join the platform. And perhaps your platform requires you to do tech checks. What does that check tech entail? So I want to just make sure, oh, we're getting close on time. So I'm going to keep drilling through. This is what my, um, my workspace looks like for virtual events. And I check my internet speed. I've got all of my, um, oops, my timer keeps telling me. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. You're telling me too. Um, that we're almost done, but this is kind of what that looks like, as you can imagine. And then execution tips. So I'm not going to read through all of these, but I can share my slides so you guys can pull them out. But there's a million things that I could go through just to make sure you're executing properly. I think the number one thing is QA, those QA checkpoints to make sure you're checking everything. And then it's over. So building your post event plan, making sure you have your editing, your attendee survey, you're celebrating your team, you're doing a retrospective, so you're continually improving. You understand what you're doing next with all of that wonderful content. And then you appreciate your speakers, sponsors, and anybody else that was involved in your team. Um, and then it's time to start planning your next event. So thank you. That is the per, um, presentation today. I know we're right at two o'clock. I was hoping to have a bit of Q&A, but I think diving into some of those, um, those things, I think is really, really nice for you guys to get that more detail and you can go back and rewatch. Um, I also would love to get your feedback. Um, I can share the feedback with everybody, but getting your feedback really helps me understand like how I'm presenting and, and all that stuff, and then how I can add more value in the future. That's it, Katie. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you, everyone that has been attending. We actually got some really great questions sent to my DM. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I put them in the run of show. So um, <laughs> if you're okay with it, Lisa, and if everyone else is okay with it, uh, we will toss it into the events channel in the community. And hopefully Lisa can give us a few more minutes over time, give us some great responses. Yeah. I am like blown away. So um, I can't wait to dig into the slide deck even more. And so once we get yeah. this live, we'll share the recording and the slide deck, uh, if Lisa's okay with that as well. Yeah. And yeah, this is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was such a, an informative session. I'm like, I, I have so many things I need to start thinking about now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're just like, oh no, my to-do list just got longer. It and did. you know what, it not every did. event, not every event will give you the space to do, be that strategic. Yeah. Sometimes your manager is just going to say, okay, you have a virtual event in three weeks, figure it out. But yeah. at least you have at least some sort of guidebook to be like, okay, well, I don't have time for that, but I could do this. Um, so that's great. Yeah, it's, I'm very excited. There's definitely things I know for our sessions that it's like, okay, what do I need to plan out for this? How do I plan better? And so I'm excited to implement a lot of this. So can't wait to hear. Um, like I posted in the chat, if you like this session, give Lisa the feedback, share on LinkedIn, tag us. Uh, we've got a gift card for folks that are going to be sharing on social. So keep an eye out for that. And can't wait to see y'all in the community. Thank you so much, Lisa. You're very, very welcome. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye, y'all.